And so, Father, you are good. We sing that, but you know that we don't really believe that, not completely. Father, we live in a world of lies, and I think we believe so many of them. We're preaching through Romans, Father. This is our 31st sermon, and I know that at times it seems really complex to me and to all of us. And yet, Lord God, I think I see that it's not at all complex. It's the lies that we have believed about you that are complex. And so, Father, I suppose in some ways for our small brains, you, you, you seem complex, and yet, Lord, would you, by the power of your Spirit, connect the dots and help us to see your heart because you are Jesus. And so, Father, um, this world convinces us that you're not Jesus. But Jesus said if we've seen him, we've seen the Father. So, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to see you this morning. I pray that through the power of your Spirit, you'd preach your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans uh, chapter 11, verse 1. I asked then, has God rejected his people? By no means. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Remember what uh, Paul wrote in chapter 8. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers, and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So who, pray tell, did God not foreknow? I mean, did he make some people, like while he was drunk, you know what I mean, breathe his breath into them, into the dust, and then forgot about them? Scripture is clear that God makes everything that's anything with his word, and everything that he makes is good. And yet Jesus, the word of God, did mention that there would be some on that day to whom he would say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Surely he would know everyone he had made. But perhaps uh, he doesn't know the one that he didn't make, for that one doesn't actually exist. <laughs> that is the self that you think that you have made, your ego. That's the self that is jealous of other selves, right? For it compares itself to other selves, and it thinks, I deserve things that, uh, it appears that that other self has that I don't have. But if a self is truly created by God, what could that self deserve anything with? The deserver is undeserved. And every deserver is undeserved. And so no deserver is better or worse than any other uh, deserver for God makes everything that's anything and all that God makes is good. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it, writes Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter three. God has done it so that people would fear before him. Every other self that God has made may be very different from, from me, but, but none of them are better than me. None of them are worse than me. For all are made by God and all that God makes is, is good. And so on that day, on that day, I probably shouldn't mention my resume. I mean, I probably shouldn't mention, you know, where I think I've been successful relative to other people or maybe where I've been a failure uh, relative to other people because he just might say, depart from me. I never knew you. In other words, I didn't make you. And so you don't actually exist. You must be dreaming. 
I don't know where you're from. You know, in a dream, you don't know where you're from, right? You're suddenly just there. You, you don't know how you got there, and there isn't actually anywhere. And yet, you are conscious of that nowhere. In fact, you're trapped in that nowhere, thinking it's somewhere, until someone wakes you with maybe just a word. So who are you? Apparently, according to Isaiah 29, which Paul has been quoting, Israel had come to believe that they had created themselves. That's when he talks about the potter and the pot and all that stuff in Isaiah 29. That they had created themselves and therefore deserved God's favor. And Isaiah 29 reveals they're dreaming. Their true self is imprisoned in a false self that is their own ridiculous ego. Israel thinks that they chose God, and so they deserve God, but there is a remnant that knows that they have been chosen by God. And that means everything, everything is, is grace. Paul calls them the elect in verse 5, but check this out, Israel had been or has been the elect. So, okay, so anyway, Romans 11, verse 11, he continues, so I ask, did they, did Israel stumble in order that they might fall? What a question. Paul assumes that there's a purpose to the stumble of, of Israel. He just told us, verse seven, that God had hardened their hearts. Why did he do that? He already told us in chapter nine that God had hardened Pharaoh's heart. Why did he do that? And of course, the mother of all stumbles was Eve and Adam's stumble in, in the garden. And you read it, it sure seems like God set them up. Maybe the mother of all stumbles, all falls, was Israel's fall in the garden on Mount Calvary. And that, that was a setup from the foundation of the world. So, God, did he arrange all of that? Scripture sir, seems to say, yeah. Did he do that just so that they would fall and stay fallen? In other words, did God create people just to send them to hell and then leave them in hell? Romans 11, verse 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? Make a noito. Hell no, writes Paul. By no means, rather, through their trespass, literally through their falling away, salvation has come to the nations, to the Gentiles, to make Israel jealous. So as to make Israel, that's Paul's church, say, hey, those nations don't deserve to be saved. Don't we deserve to be saved? Or maybe so that we would say, hey, foreigners and non-Christians and sinners don't deserve to be saved. What's wrong with you, God? Don't we deserve to be saved? And I suppose that once non-Christians know they've been saved, God will arrange for others to be saved so that they'll say, hey, don't we deserve to be saved? And that's all rather ironic for to say, hey, don't we deserve salvation is in fact damnation. <laughs> For we're only saved by grace, through faith. And this not of ourselves, lest none should boast. Verse 11, salvation has come to the nations, to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now if their trespass, their falling, means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the nations, the Gentiles, how much more will their pleroma, their full inclusion, the, their fullness mean? And now Paul just asserted what the law and the prophets have asserted all along. Ezekiel sees dry bones rise up out of the grave, out of Sheol, uh, take on flesh and enter the land. And then God says, Ezekiel, this is the whole house of Israel. 
Moses and the prophets reveal that God will gather Israel like one man and, and you give them a new heart and they will inherit the blessing. In Genesis, it's clear that, the, and Paul says this in Galatians, the promise is to you, Abraham, and to your seed. Galatians, uh, Paul also reveals that the seed is Jesus, but it's also a remnant, and it's also Israel, and maybe us, for we too are Abraham's seed by faith. So Paul is saying Israel took the life of the Messiah. This is, a, this is a pretty big fall. Israel took the life of the Messiah on the tree, in the garden, and it meant riches for the world. So just imagine what it will mean when Israel receives the life of the Messiah from the tree in the same garden. Verse 13, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my, not fellow Jews, but literally my flesh, jealous, and thus save some of them. For if their rejection, their rejection, literally the rejection of them, but now Paul just told us, hell no, God has not rejected his people. So the rejection of them could be a subjective genitive, meaning that Paul is speaking of Israel's rejection of Christ, because that's what happened at the cross, right? But the rejection of them could also be an objective genitive, meaning that Paul is speaking of God's rejection of Israel. But Paul didn't say Israel. He said flesh. And Paul has already told us that God rejects our flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. You, you know that, right? That God, God rejects our bodies of sin and death, our psychikos bodies in which we are all Imprisoned In 1 Corinthians 15, 44, God rejects the psychicos bodies that we think we have created in order to free us and give us a pneumaticos body, a spiritual body, a body that he has created. And check this out. That is not less real. That is more real than space and time itself. Verse 15, for if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, that's a big word, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered us first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And you remember he was talking about the lump before when he was talking about vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. In 1951, in his uh, seminal book, Christ in Time, theologian Oscar Kuhlman pointed out that the, the truth, quote, the truth that redemption will be universal is represented by this diagram, shape of history. God begins history with Adam over there on the left, who is humanity. Adam means humanity, and then he chooses Israel. And then he chooses a remnant of Israel. Then he chooses the stump, which turns out to be the root, which is the promised seed, which is Jesus, who then chooses the 12, the new Israel, the church, who are to bring the gospel to the world, the revelation that God is in Christ has, has chosen, God has chosen to redeem all humanity. So at the middle of history stands this tree. You know, tree and cross are, can be one word in Greek and in Hebrew. This tree in, in this garden. And this tree is also this tree, which stands at the edge of time and eternity in the garden sanctuary of every human heart. In the beginning, each of us took fruit from the tree in an effort to make ourselves in the image of God. And what we made wasn't our true selves but false selves, and then together, false tribes, and false nations, and a false world. You could think of that as the history of the Old Covenant and Israel. You remember that um, Isaiah was called to preach Israel down to a remnant, and then a stump that is a root, that is Jesus, who is the promised seed. At the cross, God in Christ Jesus reveals that he gives us 
his life, even as we take his life, revealing that he is the good, and in fact, everything, everything is grace. At the cross, God reveals his judgment upon the old world, which we tried to create in the power of the flesh, according to works of the law, which is the knowledge of good and evil taken from the tree. Isaiah is called to preach it down to a root. And at the cross, God reveals his judgment to create a new world, or that he has created a new world in place of the old world in the power of love, which is the judgment of God, which produces the fruit of life. So, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more and filled all things. What's the root? The root is the love of God revealed in human flesh. The root is Jesus. And Jesus is the beginning and Jesus is the end. Jesus is the plot. The tree was there in the beginning when we took the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the tree is there in the end where it gives life to the nations in the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of God. It's the tree of life. And the tree is in the middle of this story in the form of a cross. The fruit of the tree is the judgment of God. Before Christ, we relate to the tree as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And after Christ, the tree relates to us as the tree of life. Because it turns out Jesus is the life. Enthroned upon the tree. He's the judgment of love, and God is love. So this is the history of the world. The world that humanity builds on the left and the world that God builds on the right. And this is the history of your world, your interior world, the history of every atom. The self that you build on the left and the self that God creates on the right. It turns out that your interior world is somehow related to your exterior world. For as Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. And where's the tree? Well, the tree is there in the beginning and there in the end. The tree is in the garden sanctuary of the human heart for we are in fact the temple of God. On the left, we relate to the tree as if it were the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and it is. At the cross, we come to know about evil, right? On the right, we relate to the tree as if it were the tree of life, and it is. <laughs> On the cross, God gives us his life, and that is the good. <laughs> and the good is love, which is the judgment of God. And now I need to mention this as well, that the reality on the right is far bigger, number one, and far better, number two, and far more real, number three, than the reality on the left, which actually isn't real, but something more like a shadow of the reality on the right. So number one, the reality on the right is bigger, in the reality on the left, each one of us is alone, just like Adam was alone, remember, in the Garden of Eden before the fall, and that's not good, even though Adam doesn't know it's not good at the time. But in the reality on the right, Adam is not alone because he's part of a body. So number two, the reality on the right is, is bigger and it's better, for in the reality on the left, Adam was alone in his own flesh, feeling his own pain and his own pleasure, uh, but in the reality on the right, each member, and I don't know if you can see it, we talked about this slide last time, but that's like a body made up of a bunch of other bodies, but in the reality on, on the right, each member bleeds for every other member. In other words, everyone loves because everyone knows it's all for one and one for all. Which means no member of this body experiences any pain 
Because what is pain? It's when your body experiences division. Experiences doesn't experience any pain for each member receives life and gives life. And check this out, the life is in the blood. There is no pain, but there is absolute pleasure for the pleasure of one is the pleasure of all and the pleasure of all is the pleasure of one. And what is pleasure? It's a body when it's all working. So one day, one day, check this out, you'll drink a glass of wine and I'll feel it in my blood. And one day, I will eat a delicious piece of bread and it'll put meat on your bones for we'll be one body, one living body. Paul just wrote, if their rejection, the rejection of them, means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? He's saying that the death of Jesus doesn't simply mean that everything's forgiven, and now we'll just go back to the way that things were. That's how we talk about it sometimes. He's saying that we weren't actually alive because each of us were alone, but when Christ rises in us, one will bleed for all and all will bleed for one, and that's not death. That's the life. That's eternal life. That's eternal. So number three, Paul is saying that the reality on the right side of the cross is not only bigger, not only better, it's actually the only one that's real. That is the reality on the left is an empty shadow of the reality on the right. In other words, we've all been dreaming that we are our own creators and we must all awaken to the eternal glory of God. First, Paul will soon tell us, God consigned all to disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all. Or as Paul has already told us, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Sin is like a bad dream. And grace is the eternal reality to which you must awaken. And when we awaken, we will know everything that we dream, but we'll know it in a new way, not as a shadow of a substance, but as the substance himself. Paul says the substance belongs to Christ. So God allows each of us and all of us to dream a dream that becomes a nightmare. We each dream we are our own creators, saviors, and redeemers, but he enters our dreams as a word and reveals himself, waking us to the reality that we are his creation and actually everything that's anything is grace. Now, that sounds so complex, right? And yet, in another way, it's all so profoundly simple. As the word is heard from the throne in Revelation 21, verse 5, look, I make all things new. And now at this point, some people hear that, and they say, great. We don't have to do anything. God does everything. And great. We no longer need to fear God. And super duper great, there is no such thing as hell, and so we can't go there. <laughs> Romans eleven sixteen, If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Next verse. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive sheet, shoot, sheet, shoot, you, you Gentiles, were grafted in among the others, Israel, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, don't be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. And then you will say, well, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of the unbelief, the, literally the unfaith. But you stand fast through the faith, and remember faith is a miracle, right? That's what he's been telling us, faith is a gift. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity, sever, cut, severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. Holy shit. Sorry. This. 
It's the word that comes to my mind because it appears that you can go to hell. It sounds like you can go to hell and so we better fear God. And maybe we better do something like get more knowledge of good and evil and apply it to our lives in order to make ourselves in the image of God for God might not love us and he might not make us new. So let me just assure you right now, God will make all things new, including you, for God is love. And God loves you absolutely unceasingly and unconditionally. But yeah, I think you can go to a place that we often call hell. It's interesting that in your English Bible, Paul never uses the word hell. And that's utterly fascinating because he was preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, the nations. However, in most English Bibles, Jesus seems to use the word hell quite a bit, actually more than anybody, and that's utterly fascinating because he was preaching the gospel to Israel, his old church, the people of God. And yet, it's important to notice that Jesus did not speak English, at least not at that time, he spoke Aramaic, which is kind of like garden variety Hebrew, and his words were recorded in Greek. So, so hell is an English word from a German root, and if you think it means endless conscious torment, then Jesus never talked about it, never mentioned it. Indeed, that idea cannot be found in all of Scripture, and I have looked for it hard. Indeed, torment cannot be endless, for Jesus is the end of everything that's anything, even the no things, like darkness, lies, and death. And he's not darkness, lies, and death. He's the light and, and the truth and the life. In the New Testament, there are three Greek words that are sometimes translated in English Bibles as hell. And in the Old Testament, there's one word that is sometimes translated as hell. All those words represent three ideas two of which are the exact opposites of each other, and one of which uh, stands for the transition between the two, the place the other two meet. So, so think of hell, so think of it this way. Think of hell number one, all right, as over here on my right but your left, and think of hell number two as over here on your right but, but my left, and think of hell number three as the place where hell number one and hell number two come together. In the Old Testament, hell number one is the Hebrew word sheol, which is also translated the grave, but is sometimes, particularly in older English translations, translated as, as hell. When the Bible was translated from Hebrew into Greek in Jesus' day, day she, sheol was usually translated as Hades. And so in the New Testament times, Jesus probably said something like Sheol in, in Aramaic, but it was recorded as Hades and then translated as hell in some places in some older English Bibles 1,500 years later. In the Old Testament, everyone, from Moses to Jezebel, and some people think maybe there are possibly a couple exceptions, but I'm not even sure about that. Everyone descends into Sheol. But for some, the experience is restful. And for those that seem to go deeper down, it's more restless. But in all scripture, Sheol Hades is the experience of the absence of God. And not only do I think you can go there, I think I've, I think I've been there. In fact, I have a little video. That's a, a cell phone video made by Robert Gelinas, the pastor of Colorado Community. When he borrowed my old office in our old church building that we rented on 30th and Vallejo, he sent me the video and he said, Peter, you gotta check out this video because it looks like an angel or, or actually more like a, a demon. The next Sunday, I was talking to a new person and she asked, do people ever see things in your church? And I said something like, well, I suppose. And she said, last Sunday I saw this black shadow come out of that corner over there and fly across the room. My husband saw it too. 
I said, really? <laughs> I think we have a video. She saw that video and said, that's what I saw. And I'm a reporter from Fox 31 News, and can I do a story? What is this darkness caught on tape Thursday on Fox 31 News at 9? When she came to do the story, she said, Peter, did you know, I was doing research, did you know that this old building was built on a Masonic cemetery with much controversy in 1890? I didn't know that, but I have my suspicions because Susan and I and some folks on our prayer team have been praying. We discovered that the dark thing was named Secrets. And it was under the authority of this other thing named Antichrist, which means imitation Christ. And it was under the authority of this thing named Lucifer. Well, after we bound those things, and I know all of this sounds really weird to you, but just go with it for a minute at least, all right? After we bound those things, we began to encounter other things. Not demonic spirits, but ghosts. I didn't see them, but others did. Turned out the guy that owned the building was even doing ghost tours. <laughs> others saw them, like my wife. Now, Susan was our cleaning lady at the time, and so she'd come and get me in my office to go pray with her and tell them to leave. In the Old Testament, in English translation, they're called ghosts or familiar spirits, or shades, or simply the dead. In Isaiah 29, remember which Paul has been quoting, God says to Jerusalem, you will be brought low. And from the, do from the dust, your voice shall come from the ground like or as the voice of, of a ghost. An ob in Hebrew. Ob is also translated water skin or water bottle. So a ghost is like a tupas. Remember when we talked about the tupas? It was that thing on the left. A ghost is like a, a tupas from Romans 5, the imprint of a man absent the life of a man. We've spent months now talking about the way in which we each build a, a physical body, right? And a psychical body body. As Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15, a soul, the psyche, the psyche that you must lose in order to, to find. And I said, if you do not surrender your soul to Jesus before your physical body dies, you can be trapped in that psychic body after the physical body dies. And maybe you already are. I think that place where you get trapped is called Hades, Sheol, hell number one. Now you can hear all about that in three sermons that I preached in September of 2010 that you can find on our website titled Jesus in the Land of Ghosts. Hades, Sheol is the land of ghosts. And I mentioned that because people say Peter Hyatt does not believe in hell. And I'm saying no, I do not say that. I say that nobody believes in hell because that's what hell is, not believing, but I think I've been there. You see, there is actually here in this world. And you can get there simply by closing the eyes of your heart and refusing to believe the word, the gospel. There is here, and you may be trapped in there even now as you're listening to this very message. You know, David in the Old Testament talks about being entangled in Sheol, even descending into Sheol, and then coming up from Sheol all before his physical body dies. In Scripture, Sheol Hades starts here on the surface of the earth, and it can continue under the earth after the body dies. That's hell number one and you can picture it here on your left. Hell number two is the exact opposite of hell number one, and you can picture it here on your right. Not only can folks go to hell number two, I think I've been to hell number two. Or I should say hell number two has been to me. Hell number two is the eternal fire. Years ago at a conference in Canada, uh, after about six hours after God revealed the hell in which I had uh, trapped myself, he literally pinned me to the floor and told me to stop doubting his love for me. And it felt like so much electricity. 
and fire and love was and joy was coursing through my body, I literally thought I was going to explode. I, I literally thought, he's killing me. And it turns out that I think he was. He was killing the old Adam. Hell number two cannot be the same thing as hell number one because in the Revelation, death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire and death is no more. Hell number one is cast into the lake of fire and divinity. That's hell number two and death is no more. Hell number two is also called heaven. Hell number two is the manifest presence of the Lord and it destroys the manifest absence of the Lord like light destroys shadows, like truth destroys lies, like life destroys death, and the way destroys the lost. <laughs> Why? Well, because once you know the way, you can no longer be the lost. You are the found. And hell number three is where that happens. The transition. There's one other word that's sometimes translated as hell in the New Testament, and that's the word Gehenna. Not only can folks go to hell number three, I've actually been to hell number three, where I took this picture of a bunch of folks ironically having a barbecue. I've been there. And then kind of in another way, I think I, I go there every time I confess my sins and believe God's mercy, every time I submit to the judgment of God. Gehenna is a Greekified name for the Valley of Hinnom that borders Jerusalem on, on two sides. So I, took this picture when we were visiting Jerusalem. In Hebrew thought, in reality, Jerusalem is the site of the temple, which is the site of the garden, which is the site of the tree, and is the place where the new Jerusalem comes down and becomes an entire new creation. Gehenna is the place where the kingdoms of this world, built by the judgments of men, encounter the kingdom of God, which is eternal. That means of the age to come, which is always now, for it is not subject to time, but in fact is like the substrate or context or container of all time. Hopefully remember that this is the way in which scripture talks about time. There are six or possibly seven days or ages, ions of chronos that's chronological time and then comes the seventh day or ion that is the sabbath day where everything is good and it is finished and on that day according to revelation 10 6 chronos will be no more maybe because it's filled you, you see hell number one hades sheol is on the timeline and it comes to an end in hell number two, the eternal fire that is the presence of God, who is absolute love, who surrounds the timeline, kind of like a mother surrounds her own womb. Hell number one comes to an end in hell number two, and the, the end of the timeline, the, the judgment of God, which is hell number three. But the judgment of God has been revealed in time on the sixth day, on the tree in the garden, where the word of God cries, Father, forgive them, and it is finished, and he delivers up his spirit. Paul calls it the end of the ions. Deliver up his spirit that falls on you and begins to fill you with faith and love, which you experience as hope, which transforms death into life. Hell number one is on the timeline, but comes to an end at hell number two, where it is momentarily experienced as hell number three. And check this out. Scripture speaks of hell number one as space in the depths of the earth. And yet in the end, the earth gets filled with the glory of God, which is hell number two, the substance of heaven, and that transition is experienced as hell number three. 
And scripture also speaks as if hell number one begins in us. You see, it is our sin, which is a bondage to a lie that generates the old man, which is the bad dream that is turned into the nightmare, the nightmare that we often call hell, in which our consciousness is now held captive. The coming of Christ is the judgment of God that destroys hell number one with the presence of hell number two, which often feels like hell number three, because it is. And oh, I've been there a lot. When I confess my sin and believe God's mercy, sometimes it burns. Why? Well, I think it's because I think that Hades is where I belong because I am the lost. And I think that who, and, and I think it, 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 that's who I am, but God is revealing that somehow he is who I am and with him is where I belong. I'm not the lost, I'm the found. And that's eternal. You see, hell is never simply retributive which means like payback, right? But in some sense, it's always restorative, but even more than that, it's creative. For God didn't create you just so he could punish you. God is creating you so that you would enjoy him. As he is always enjoying you, his, his image, his kid. Hell, all three hells are disciplined. And discipline is always the work of love. Now, I don't know if many people knows this, but I have four children. Well, you know that, but maybe what you didn't know is all of them were born antisocial. I mean, each one of them tried to be first by making another one of them last. Can you imagine that? And in this way, I knew that each of them could end up possibly forever alone. But a family happens when the first chooses to be last in order to make the last first, and then those that are first once again choose to be last to make others first. A party happens when the exalted humble themselves by exalting the humble, who in turn do just the same, like a bunch of dancers in a great dance, all deferring one to the other. Life happens when everyone freely chooses to love, so all are one, and everyone experiences the joy of all. Well, each of my children were born rather antisocial, and because I loved them, I hated that fact, and I wanted to teach them to love. So sometimes when they were being antisocial, I'd punish them. You know how? By making them even more antisocial. I mean, I would cut them off, sever them from the family. I mean, I would send them to their room alone. And even if they beg for mercy, I'd leave them in their room for a time because that was the greatest mercy. I wanted them to hate being alone. I'd stand outside the door so they weren't really alone. I'd stand outside the door and my heart would be with them on the other side of the door on the inside, but I let them experience my absence so that they would long for my presence and their brothers and sisters' presence and our presence. In other words, I'd ground them for a time. That's hell number one. And then I would, I, would sit next to them on their bed. My presence was like hell number two. And then the worst, I'd talk to them. <laughs> and they felt my words. Some of them burned like hell number three. But then I would wipe the tears away and sometimes they would my, wipe my tears away and we'd begin to laugh we begin to party. And that party is life. And eternal life is heaven. And that, my dear, is your home. Now, I know we're all insecure, so let me just say every child is different, just like every person is different. And that, my friends, is by design. 
And those that require the most discipline, like Saul of Tarsus, may reveal the most brilliant glory, like Paul, the apostle of grace. Every child is different, but all the children need discipline. For without discipline, they will remain forever alone. Hebrews 12, 7, it is for discipline that you have to endure. If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate. In other words, if you don't suffer, you're a bastard. And none of you are bastards because I know, I can tell just by looking at you, you all suffer. When you suffer, the evil one will whisper, fear God and run from his judgment because you are not a son. But Jesus will whisper, fear God and so run into his judgment for we are being disciplined as sons. We are being disciplined as sons, and let's just get to that party as quick as we can. Scripture says fear is the beginning of wisdom. Scripture also says perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love in human flesh is wisdom. Wisdom is Jesus, and Jesus in you, and Jesus, he, he's in you. He's in you to walk you through the valley of the shadow of death into the kingdom of love. Jesus is the judgment of God conquering the old stone temple that is your soul. He is the kindness of God and the severity of God. He's the lion and the lamb, and they are one. God is one. Romans eleven twenty two. 22. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be severed, grounded, cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness, the pleroma of the Gentiles, the nations, has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from or, or out of Zion. It's interesting here. Isaiah 59, Isaiah actually says the deliverer will come to Zion. But for some reason, Paul changes it to the deliverer will come out of Zion. And that's the temple which turns out to be us. The deliverer will come out of Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Imagine, maybe you have enemies for your sake. Maybe all your enemies are for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. God not only redeems Jesus, raises him from the dead. He not only redeems the remnant. He not only redeems Israel, but all humanity. So you can go to hell but you can't stay there. Or if you stay there, he'll just turn it into heaven. And you must fear God until God is the only one that you fear. And then God, who is perfect love, will cast out all fear. And far from doing nothing, you will do all things, for the deliverer will come to Zion and the deliverer will come out of Zion. In other words, you will speak the word and give birth to the new creation. Now you may have noticed that walking through hell number one and uh, hell number three into hell number two, which is heaven, looks an awful lot like Oscar Kuhlman's depiction of human history. And that looks an awful lot like the creation of every man. 
and that picture is actually this picture. Eve takes the fruit and kills the Christ, the eschatos Adam. But there's seed in the fruit. The seed dies and rises in Mary, who delivers the living word. You understand, we're the bride of Christ, who gives birth to the new creation. And it turns out that we are, just like Adam said, the mother of the living. Now, I know that all sounds theoretical. But it actually happened several times to me, and you can hear about it or read about it in those sermons that I mentioned on their website. Susan came and got me because she encountered ghosts or ghosts. I mean, what is she supposed to do? You should never seek ghosts for information. So hear me well. You should never seek ghosts for information. Why? Because they're lost. <laughs> They don't know the way. But it turns out that you can give them information if you've heard the word because then you are not lost. And you know the way. On several occasions, I ended up preaching to the ghosts. And by that, I mean I just told them about Jesus. That's what preaching means. It means telling somebody something, proclaiming something. On two occasions, my wife or members of our prayer team saw Jesus appear in, in a vision, and those ghosts that would look at him, that would lift their heads and look at him, would suddenly rise and go to him and be transformed. And then on two occasions, they saw a door open down there under the church, and there was like a new creation on the other side, and they went through the door. And the, the last time it happened, Jesus said, I'm leaving the door open for those that will still follow. I mean, it was incredible. But for me, the first occasion impacted me the most. Susan saw this old woman at the bottom of the stairwell in the southeast corner of the building, and I had never encountered anything like this before, and so I spoke to her like a demon, as I had learned to do, taking authority and binding, all that stuff, until Susan said, Peter, I don't think she's a demon, because they react to the word in a different way. She said, I think she's lost. And then she said, her name is Elise. Later I learned that that's Hebrew for promise of God <laughs> or something like that. And so I remember I said to her, which ironically is the thing that I would command a demon, I said, Elise, you need to go to Jesus. And then I just told her about Jesus. I said something like, at least they, and we had come to realize there was a they. I said, they may have done terrible things to you and done them in the name of Jesus, but you need to know that's not Jesus. They may have told you that Jesus doesn't love you, but I'm telling you, Jesus died for you, for he will always love you, and absolutely nothing can change his mind. He's waiting for you, Elise, and you need to go to him. And then I remember Susan said, well, she's gone. And I thought, good, because it's been a weird day and I just want to go home. I went to get my stuff out of the office. I walked back into that old sanctuary that you saw in the video to find Susan, to find her standing there with this look of absolute astonishment on her face. And she said, Peter, I just heard Jesus clear as a bell. He said, welcome home. Elise, and then I heard Elise. She said, I was lost. I bet there are lost people all around you, and they haven't heard the word. You now have the word, so speak it to them. Don't wait for their physical body to die. You can go to hell right now 
and give them Jesus. Jesus said the gates of hell, but in Greek he said the gates of Hades, which would have been in Hebrew the gates of Sheol, will not prevail against my church. That's his body. That's his bride who gives birth to the word and changes the world. Sometimes people actually say to me, Peter, if everyone gets saved in the end, why would I preach the gospel now? And that tells me that those people have never actually heard the word and are rather comfortable in hell. And so I preach the gospel now. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, this is the covenant in my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you. This is the word. If you've heard the word, then preach the gospel. And the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. And so I think he says to you, okay, so stop doubting my love for you. I know you live in a world where you experience great suffering, where everything is collapsing in on itself. <laughs> but I have a reason for that. And you'll soon, soon see the reason for that. He'll be standing right in front of you, his face shining like the sun. And when you see him, when you see my heart, don't turn and run. The only place safe to hide from the judgment of love is hell. That's what C.S. Lewis wrote, that's Hades. But if you hide there, even there he'll find you. But I don't know why you would want to stay there, so you might as well leave there right now and believe his love for you. Amen. I, I, I think that pretty much every sermon is basically that. So I said it's complex and this is just, I'm trying to get, stop doubting his love for you. And when I speak to you, I'm speaking to myself. And that's the one thing I really heard God speak to me years ago. First, Peter, you don't love my bride very much, which cut, which burned like hell. And yet it was so kind. He said it with the utmost compassion. And then later that day, I, I heard him in a different way say, stop doubting my love for you. So you see, I think that's what I'm supposed to say to the church, the bride. Uh, I used to have a really big church. I mean, but I think I was supposed to say to the bride, stop doubting his love for you. Now, um, today's sermon, uh, I know was felt complicated. We we're to the 11th chapter of Romans, and I'm just really glad that you hung in there with me to this point. Paul's gonna turn a corner at the end of this chapter and uh, next week, I'm going to show kind of like my favorite children's movie, which I think kind of pulls everything together. But it's complicated because the lies are complicated. We live in a world where the evil one constantly lies to us. And everything he's saying is to the effect of the father doesn't, doesn't love you. And I think one of the most effective ways that he does that is with um, this talk about unending conscious torment, which wasn't the belief of the church till probably like around, or predominantly in the church till around 500 AD or so when the church became part of the Roman Empire. And so if you want to explore this more, which I would love for you to explore this more, because we all say we believe, but then we, we live like crap because we don't believe, and I know it's not true that we believe. Um, that's why we have these little books and you can get one in the back or you can get one at Amazon or you can go to our website and it's a free download. All things new, what does the Bible really say about hell in which I know stories, I just try to lay it out really, really simple. 
If you don't like that and you like stories, well then go online and Google Hallelujah in Hell, which was a little movie we made many years ago, which was about the three hells. Some of you have heard me talk about that before. If you go, well that part about discipline was kind of intriguing, well then go online and Google um, the flaming toilet of death and that's about uh, God's discipline. But all of that is to just say, stop doubting his love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.